Okay, okay, one of those infinite dead. Um, you shouldn't be able to do. Oh, you already are. A split. I know we can do bigger ones up here. Um, <laughs> Maybe I'll turn this off and you can. No, we're not going to spend it right now. So. Brian, less than an hour it'll be over. <laughs> and the feedback says. <laughs> job that you're doing and that's why I would much rather be the speaker than any of the tech guys. <laughs> Good morning once again to uh, the Family Bible Hour online at IBC. We had a nice time this morning together at the Breaking of Bread, and today we'll continue our usual program and uh, sing a few songs, uh, just directing our thoughts towards uh, Jesus and what he has done for us and the great King that we have. Uh, and then afterward, Brian, our theme, will be coming up and sharing a few thoughts uh, that he's prepared for us. Let's sing a few songs. Jesus loves me, this I know. Yes, 
by his own betrayed. Sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus slain. Silent as he stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned. Bowing to the Took a crown of thorns. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, Hallelujah. to purchase and redeem. Reconcile the very ones who nailed him to that tree. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah. Praise and honor unto Thee. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full. My precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. The sun sets free, oh, is free. See you. 
dangers, toils, and snares have already come. Tis grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. My chains are gone. sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever mine you are forever
shouts and saints at all. Your holy, holy, holy Lord. What joy in everlasting life. All is love and faith aside. Justice rolls and praises rise at the name of Jesus Christ. King of kings forever. King of kings forever. King Thanks for singing along. I hope those songs were encouraging. Uh, we're just going to take a couple, half a minute here and uh, reconfigure a couple things while Dean comes up and share us his thoughts. Well, good morning, everyone here. Well, of course, there's only us here, but uh, you out there, we're glad that you've been able to join us here this morning as we continue on with our family Bible hour. Um, for better or for worse, you probably noticed that uh, I'm here for a second week in a row. Uh, the reason for that is that our other two speakers are on well-deserved vacations, but Brian will be back next Sunday to resume his topic. My subject has, has been uh, good kings from bad families. And uh, one of the advantages of speaking back to back like I'm doing here this morning is that I don't have to do a big review of what I covered the last time. I'm assuming that you all remember most of it. Um, but what I will say is that what we have done over the last two sessions is we've looked at two generations of kings of Judah. The first king was King Ahaz. We saw that he was a pretty bad king. He abandoned the worship of the Lord, plunged into idolatry. He was also a bad role model for his son Hezekiah, but thankfully that didn't influence Hezekiah in a bad way. He turned out to be a good king. The Word of God says that he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He undertook a religious restoration of the land of Judah and destroyed the idols. We saw that Hezekiah was in fact a good king, but that he wasn't a perfect person. He had a couple of lapses of faith that are recorded in the scriptures, uh, which just reminds us that we all have to be diligent ourselves to uh, make sure that we are following the Lord uh, right to the end of the spiritual battle that we're in. This morning, we're going to look at his son, Manasseh. Hezekiah dies, and then his son, who is 12 years old, takes over the throne. You might think that given that he had a father who was such a good role model, and that he was only 12, he was a young fellow when he took over the, the, the role of king, that he would have wanted to follow in his father's footsteps. That's what you would think. Well, let's read in 2 Chronicles chapter 33 and see what he did. 2 Chronicles 33, verse 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down, 
He raised up altars for the Baals, made wooden images, and he worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. He also built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. He practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft and sorcery, consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He even set a carved image, the idol which he had made, in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land which I have appointed for your fathers, only if they are careful to do all that I have commanded them, according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. So Manasseh seduced Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. I don't know about you, but I find that rather shocking. Not only did Manasseh not follow in his father's footsteps, he seemed to deliberately want to go in a completely different direction. He basically undid everything good that his father had done. You'll notice that two times it, sa it, it says this thing here. It says that, that Manasseh put idle things in the place where God said he'd put his name forever. Now the fact that the scriptures reports that little expression two times suggests that the scripture is trying to make a point here. And I think what the point is, is that <clears throat> Manasseh's sin was deliberate. This, there, there was nothing accidental about this. It was no, this was no spur of the moment decision on his part to do the things that are described here. <clears throat> it was deliberate. It was one of those shake your fist in the face of God type of decisions. He was essentially saying that, yes, God, you said you'll put your name forever here. I've got other plans. And so he plunged into the sins involved with idolatry to perhaps an unprecedented uh, level. It says that he used witchcraft, sorcery, consulted with mediums, he, he, burned, he, he, he burned his children as burnt sacrifices, he carried on in all the worst practices of the idol worship that the nations around them were doing. It's like he was deliberately trying to provoke God. And this isn't all. In the Second Kings chapter 21 account of it, it adds this about Manasseh. It says, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he'd filled Jerusalem from one end to another. So not only was Manasseh an idolater, he was also a brutal, murderous dictator. He was kind of in the line of a Hitler or a Stalin or a Pol Pot from Cambodia. There's a, Jew <clears throat> There's a Jewish tradition that says that Manasseh was the one who had the prophet Isaiah killed. And that the way he did it was he had him stuck into a hollow log and then had someone saw through that hollow log. That's really nasty stuff. It's interesting that the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, in talking about the, uh, the heroes of faith, mentions this way of some of the heroes of faith being killed. It may well be a reference to Manasseh and Isaiah killed. So there's no question Manasseh was pretty bad, worse even than his grandfather Ahaz. Perhaps so bad that someone might say, you know what, there's no hope for redemption for a guy like that. God doesn't save people who've sunk this far into sin, does he? Well, let's continue on with the story. Verse 10. And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they would not listen. This would suggest that the Lord sent prophets to Manasseh and to his people, and they wouldn't have it. Therefore, the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze fetters, and carried him off to Babylon. Now, when he was in affliction, he implored the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed to him and he received his entreaty, 
heard his supplication and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Well, here we see that God indeed can save anyone, even someone as bad as Manasseh, anyone who is willing to repent. And we see that Manasseh did open his mind to the idea of repenting. But look at what it took to get him to that point where he was willing to, to repent. It describes it for us here in verse 11. It talks about uh, God bringing the armies from Assyria to Jerusalem. They obviously took him prisoner, and it even describes what they did to Manasseh personally. It talks about these hooks. What that was, the practice of the Assyrian, was to put metal hooks, insert them into the nose of their prisoners. They would often do it with high-ranking prisoners. So they put a hook or two in there, and then they'd wrap the person around with bronze uh, fetters or chains, and then they'd drag them along. You'd, you'd be pulled along by a chain attached to those hooks. Now, I don't know about you, but I've experienced how sensitive the nose can be. A number of years ago, I had my nose smashed in an accident, and it's tender. So knowing that, you just could kind of imagine what this must have felt like to be dragged along for hours or perhaps even days with hooks in your nose. Well, obviously the pain was bad enough that Manessa started to reconsider what he had been doing and he repented and turned to the Lord. This whole incident reminds me of a quote from C.S. Lewis who's talking about what God will try to do in order to reach people. And Lewis says this, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our consciences, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Manasseh spent the first part of his reign of Judah being deaf to the entreaties of God. And so God ended up shouting to him, and that's what it took for him to respond. Now it tells us in verse 13 that what Manasseh came to knew, know was that he knew that the Lord was God. It literally took Manasseh years, perhaps decades, to come to know what his father Hezekiah seemed to have known most of his life. Namely that out of all the gods out there, there's only one who's the real deal, and that was Yahweh. Manasseh came to know that the God of the Bible, of the Old Testament, was really the only true God that there is. <clears throat> I'm sure many of you have had people say to you something like, I don't believe in God. And what they think they are telling you is that they believe that they don't believe that God actually exists. That's what they probably think they're, they're saying to you. But I'm going to suggest to you that what they are really saying, even though they would never admit it, is that I have other gods I worship. I'm not going to worship yours. The reason I say that is because God created human beings intuitive to us to worship. Now that worship is meant to be directed at God. But if it isn't, if we refuse, then we will find something or someone to worship instead. In those days, it would have been obvious what they were worshiping. There were all of these idols, representing false gods. It was Baal, Ashtoreth, Marduk. These people in those days bowed down to these idols which they believed represented certain deities. Today, it's not so obvious what people are worshiping, but it has been said by many that we today we tend to worship certain things or ideas. For example, we seem to worship money or power or sexual immorality. These are things that people pursue what I'm gonna suggest though is that the pursuit of those things is really just a manifestation of what we're really worshiping, which is ourselves. You see, when we go after money, power, sex, and those kind of things, what we're doing is we're pursuing things that will give us pleasure, that will satisfy us, which what it really means is that we are worshiping ourselves. <clears throat> and that's what Western culture is really all about, isn't it? Self-centered, self-worship. This attitude can really only be cured by us realizing the very same thing that Manessa came to realize in his day. 
namely that the Lord is God. And ever since the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, what we're called upon to acknowledge is that Jesus Christ is that Lord. In order to get right with God, we need to acknowledge at least a couple of things. And first and foremost of those is that Jesus Christ is literally God himself. He's the Son of God. But for many people, that's a, that's a tremendous stumbling block, isn't it? You can often talk with a lot of people about God in general terms and have a pretty good conversation. But as soon as you introduce the idea of Jesus Christ being God and worthy of worship, a lot of people don't want to go there. If they belong to a false religion, a cult, then the idea of Jesus being God is, is something they don't even want to entertain. Because many people in false religions are already revering and almost worshiping the founder of that religion. Most of these false religions have somebody who founded it, and the idea that Jesus Christ is God would make Jesus greater than that person. The classic example of that would be Islam. In Islam was started by a man by the name of Muhammad. Now Muslims call Muhammad their prophet. They also acknowledge that Jesus Christ is a prophet. But they believed that Muhammad was a greater prophet than Jesus was. So the idea of Jesus actually being God, that would make Jesus greater than Muhammad, and Muslims don't want to go there. That's the classic dilemma that they have. Now for an atheist, it's kind of similar in a way, because atheists worship somebody too. They worship man. They worship his reason, his intelligence, his independence, and the reason that atheists worship man, even though some of them might not admit it, is because they only want to be accountable to themselves. So the idea of Jesus being God is very unpalatable because then that would mean they would have to be accountable to him and not just to themselves. And that's something, again, that they, that they don't want to do. So an atheist will always deny the existence of God and they'll give reasons such as they'll say, well, there just is no proof. There's no evidence. Well, as Christians, we know that there is abundant evidence. The problem is that from the atheist point of view is that they don't even want to entertain the idea that there is any evidence. So they don't want to go there at all because as soon as they, they see that evidence, they're presented with proof that God exists and now they have to wrestle with the idea that they might be accountable someday to him. I suspect that Manasseh, in the early part of his reign, when he was doing all of these bad things, probably didn't think that he'd ever be held accountable either. But he came to know differently, didn't he? God intervened directly in that man's life, and he came to know what accountability and judgment was all about. Now, once Manasseh was converted, he then tried to undo the damage that he'd been doing over the years or even decades. So let's look at uh, verse 14 in 2 Chronicles 33. <clears throat> After this, he built a wall outside the city of David on the west side of Gihon in the city, in the valley, sorry, as far as the entrance of the fish gate. And it enclosed Awful, and he raised it to a very great height. <clears throat> then he put military captains in all the fortified cities of Judah. He took away the foreign gods and the idol from the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem, and he cast them out of the city. He also repaired the altar of the Lord, sacrificed peace offerings and thank offerings on it, and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people still sacrificed on the high places, but only to the Lord their God. So we see Manasseh doing some good stuff here. He was basically trying to undo the damage and, and restore Judah to the way it was when his father Hezekiah was ruling. So the things he was doing was, were good. But we notice here in verse 17 that the people weren't buying into it all 100%. They were still continuing to sacrifice in these high places. That would be on the tops of hills and mountains. I want to just quote 
John MacArthur from his commentary on this particular verse. <clears throat> MacArthur says, although the people worshiped God and not idols, they were doing it in the wrong place and wrong way. God had commanded them to offer sacrifices only in certain places, Deuteronomy chapter 12. <clears throat> this was to keep them from corrupting the prescribed forms and to protect them from pagan religious influences. That Deuteronomy 12 passage that uh, John MacArthur is referring to is where God gives instruction to the Israelites while they're out in the wilderness wandering with Moses. And he says, when you offer burnt offerings to me, I don't want you to do it in just any old place. I'm going to prescribe a place for you to do those offerings, and that's where I want you to do it. And so while they were wandering in the wilderness, that place was the tabernacle. Once they were established in the land of Israel and had Jerusalem as their capital city, it was the temple. That was where they were supposed to do it. But we see here that they weren't. They were refusing to do it. So it makes you wonder, well, why? What was the problem here? Well, I just kind of, this is my speculation. I, I'm kind of trying to put my own mind into the minds of the people there. And here's what I suspect might be behind all this. They're probably thinking, you know, Manessa, he was a pretty brutal dictator during all of these years. He persecuted the true worshipers of the true Lord God, killed a lot of us. Now he's claiming to be a man of God. Can't we trust him? You know, to think of it in more modern terms, it'd be like a, a Hitler or a Stalin suddenly claiming to be a Christian. You know, you, you'd have your doubts. And what they may have been thinking here in Manasseh's time was that, okay, now we're supposed to offer these burnt offerings in Jerusalem. If Manasseh's conversion isn't real, and we go to Jerusalem and offer these sacrifices, he'll know who we are and where we live. And he might have us killed. So maybe the best thing we can do, the safest thing we can do, is just to keep using these hills and mountains to offer our sacrifices, but we'll only offer to the Lord. We won't offer to idols anymore. That's just my idea as to what they might have been thinking. Now, when we look at Manasseh's reign, one of the things we're going to see in a moment is that this was a turning point in God's dealings with Judah. See, there was a difference in the way he dealt with Judah and the rest of Israel. Remember, they were split apart. And the rest of Israel, they had kings, different kings at different times, and they never had a single good king. They never had a king that worshipped the Lord. They all worshipped idols. And so at, there came a time when God's patience with them ended, and he raised up the Assyrian nation, and the Assyrians conquered Israel, took them into captivity, and that was the end of that. But Judah had a little bit of a different history. They had some good kings mixed in with the bad kings. And so God and didn't allow the Assyrians to conquer Judah. We saw that last week where Hezekiah and the people of Judah were spared, where God intervened and sent the Assyrians home in a miraculous way. But now with Manasseh's reign, apparently they've sunk to such a low that God's patience is wearing thin. And I want to just read a passage here in 2 Kings chapter 21 where God speaks to the, uh, to the Jews about what's been going on. <clears throat> uh, 2 Kings 21 verse 10, And the Lord spoke by his servants the prophet, saying, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, has done these abominations, he has acted more wickedly than all the Amorites who were before him, and has also made Judah sin with his idols. Therefore, so, thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such calamity upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whoever hears of it, both his ears will tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab. I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. So I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies. And they shall become victims of plunder to all their enemies, because they have done evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came out of Egypt, even to this day. I think it's pretty obvious from what God is saying there that he's fed up with them. 
he's had is now inevitable. It only becomes a matter of when. He doesn't say when he's going to do it, but it's going to happen for sure. So, Manasseh dies, and then what? What kind of king do we get next? Well, let's look at 2 Chronicles 33 and verse 20. <clears throat> so Manasseh rested with his fathers, and they buried him in his own house. Then his son Ammon reigned in his place. Ammon was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord, as his father Manasseh had done. For Ammon had sacrificed all the carved images which his father Manasseh had made, and served them. And he did not humble himself before the Lord, as his father Manasseh had humbled himself. But Ammon trespassed more and more. Then his servants conspired against him and killed him in his own house. But the people of the land executed all those who had conspired against King Ammon. Then the people of the land made his son Josiah king in his place. We see here that Ammon, when he took over the kingdom, he had a choice to, made, to make. And it's interesting to think for a moment about what kind of role models he had that may have helped determine the choice he made. We see that his father, Manasseh, was kind of a mixed bag. Early on in Manasseh's rule, he was not a good role model at all. He would be one of the worst. But then he converted to the Lord. So in the last part of his reign, he would have been a good role model. Now his grandfather, Hezekiah, as we saw in the two previous uh, messages, he was obviously a good role model, a, a great one. But if you do the math, you'll see that when Ammon was born, Hezekiah was already dead. So he never actually knew his grandfather personally, but he certainly would have heard about the exploits of Hezekiah. So he did have that as an example. We see here though, that upon taking the throne, he made his choice. And unfortunately he chose sin rather than obedience to the Lord. Which is something I think that reminds us that sin always seems to be more appealing to people than obedience to God. And I don't think that's any accident. I think that's exactly what Satan wants to do. He wants to make sin as appealing to, as possible to people. Ever since Satan first started to interact with human beings back in the Garden of, the Garden of Eden with Eve, he has tried to make the idea of disobeying God something to be desired. Remember the nature of his temptation with Eve. He told her, he says, if you eat of that fruit, he says, when you eat of it, You'll be like, just like God. You'll know good and evil. You see, the temptation there, the, the appealing part of that was, you can be just like God. And he fell for it and ate. And then her husband followed her in that. Ever since that time, Satan has been doing the same thing, using the same kind of strategy, making sin as appealing as possible. Now, in our Western culture, what I see him appealing to is our inherent self-centeredness. I talked about that a little earlier, the self-centeredness that leads to self-worship. It's that self-centeredness which says things like, my comfort, my desires, my pleasures, my satisfaction, these are the most important thing to me in all the whole world. And I will do almost whatever it takes in order to satisfy myself in these areas. And you know what? You can see evidence of that in our culture wherever you turn. Let me just give you a, a couple of examples that, that come to mind. Take you have, a, you have a young couple, and they say to each other, you know what, we want to have a baby someday, but not now. But lo and behold, she gets pregnant, and that usually is a cause for celebration in most households, but in this household, it isn't. And they say to each other, you know what, this is... This is really inconvenient. I mean, our finances are not in good shape, and we had so many other plans of things that we wanted to do. Now, if that couple, if they're the kind of people who are big into self-centered self-worship, there's an option that's gonna present itself to them that will seem appealing. Let's just end this. Let's just terminate the pregnancy. And unfortunately, in our culture, that decision gets made an awful lot of times. 
Or let's just think for a moment of a, an older couple, been married for quite a few years. And the husband starts thinking to himself, you know, my wife isn't as appealing to me as she used to be. She's just not as attractive. But that woman over there is. Or you get a wife who says, you know, my husband, he just, he, he, he's not as attentive to me as he used to be. He doesn't listen to me, he doesn't talk to me anymore. But that guy over there, he does. And so if they're the kind of people, again, who are self-centered, you know, it's all about them, who start saying to themselves things like, you know what, I have a right to be happy. I'm entitled to be happy. Then they might consider the option of leaving their spouses and moving on to another one. And again, in our culture, that happens an awful lot of times. Now, we're not told exactly what the nature of the reasons was that Ammon had before he made his choice to disobey God. You know, we can only speculate about that, but what we do know is that he chose to worship the idols, and we also see that he was taken out rather early. He only reigned for two years. You contrast that with his father Manasseh, he was there for 55 years, but here only two. His being taken out of the picture and how it happened raises one more interesting issue that I'd like to look at before I, before I end. There's no question that Ammon was a bad king, and he was probably going to get worse. He was going to be bad for the nation. So the people did the right thing in assassinating him, didn't they? Or did they? You know, I, if a king or a president or a prime minister is bad like that, citizens should have the right to take them out, right? No. From a scriptural point of view, that's absolutely the wrong way to look at it. Let me tell you why. In Romans 13, we see that God is the one who creates and institutes human government. He does it for the purpose of, of creating order in the, in the various societies in the world. We also see from the rest of the scripture that God reserves to, his, to himself the right to raise up leaders for nations, especially in a theocracy like Israel and Judah. Sometimes he raised up good ones, sometimes he raised up bad ones. He has his own reasons and purposes for doing that. But what I want to say is that if God is the one who raises them up and has the right to do it, claims that right for himself, then God is the one who has the right to take them out, particularly by means of death. So now God uses various methods to do it, Sometimes he uses sickness just to take the leader out of the picture. Sometimes he'll use war where one nation will conquer another, and that happened very commonly in the Old Testament. Sometimes he'll use the political intrigue from the political enemies of the leader where they push the person out. In a democracy like Canada, he'll use elections to get the leader that he wants to be in there, bad as well as good. These are all legitimate ways for a leader to be removed. But it appears from the scripture that what isn't legitimate is for the citizens of that country to take them out by murdering. It's just not sanctioned anywhere. You'll, find, you'll, you'll look in vain for a place where servants of leaders, political leaders, are allowed to assassinate their bosses. And I believe that's why the people of the land, it says, executed all those who had conspired against King Ammon. These people who executed him, they certainly had to know that Ammon was not a good king. Actually, he deserved to die because he was worshiping idols, and that was a capital crime. But they also knew that these people did not have the authority to do what they did. God hadn't given it to them, and no human being had given it to them. And so that's why they had to be executed in order to preserve order. So that's as far as I'm going to read today. Just a few concluding thoughts about what we have covered in the three sessions so far. In those sessions, we've actually looked at four different kings. We've looked at one good one, that was Hezekiah. We've looked at total, two totally bad ones. And then we looked at one who was bad, started out badly, but then was good because he repented. And what we see as well is we see God interacting with each of these kings according to the kind of people they were. So he brings calamity on the bad ones, 
blessing on the good one. He also brought testing on the good one. And we also see him leading one of the bad ones to repent through calamity. What was God's instrument for dealing with each one of these kings? He used the nation of Assyria. In every case, he brought Assyria against them in order to bring out the kind of things that he wanted to bring out. Now, if you were to read secular history about the history of Assyria, you would see references to some of the events <clears throat> that we have here in the uh, in Second Chronicles. <clears throat> But what you would notice as well is no mention of God. God's not mentioned in secular history. As far as secular history is concerned, all of the events that we've looked at here happened because of a combination of human will, like what people wanted to do, and perhaps coincidence, bad luck, good luck, those kinds of things. There would be no God factor in it at all as far as secular writings are concerned. If you want to discover the God factor, you have to go to the Word of God. And there you get the rest of the story, and what I would suggest is the most important part of the story. Yes, the historical events are, are important, but they're important in the context of God working His will behind the scenes. So just what I want to suggest is that just as God is working in the lives, or had worked in the lives of these four kings, He's working in your lives too. He's working in my life. And what we need to do is to live lives where we acknowledge God's presence in there, where we acknowledge God's working. We're not allowed as people of God to live as if God is irrelevant. And I'm gonna expand on that theme a little more. I know I've spoken on that theme in times past, but I'm gonna expand on it a little more when we look at the last of the kings of Judah here that we're going to deal with, King Josiah. And I'll just give you a little spoiler alert. He's so read a couple of chapters uh, that talk about him and maybe read ahead of time. And until then, let's uh, just give thanks. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word, uh, which uh, just teaches us so much about yourself. And uh, we know that many of the things that have happened in history, um, the only place we can find a purpose in it is in the Word of God. In the Word of God we can see these events from your perspective and we can learn things that uh, we need to learn in order for us to know how to conduct our lives. So we just thank you for your Word, for the Spirit that convicts us from your Word and pray that you'll be with us through the rest of this week. We ask it in Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you for being with us and we look forward to talking to you next week. God bless.